All right, well, we're back into Philippians chapter number 2, and we're going to pick it up with verses 12 and 13. If you recall, Paul has stated quite clearly that Yeshua is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Uh, All of his creation, whether it be those uh, in the spirit realm, human beings, all of creation... Uh, one day will acknowledge who exactly who he is, that he is Lord, that he is God, uh, to the glory of the Father. And so if that's the case, then we pick it up, verses 12 and 13, so then, so then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So then, my beloved, he continues, of course, speaking to true believers within the Philippian assembly. Just as you have always obeyed. Well, you might look at that and say, oh man, I mean, even in my, 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 my walk as a believer, I haven't always obeyed. And of course, we're not always going to obey, but the, 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 the phrase is more along the lines of a a life that has been sanctified by God. So you've been set aside as a believer. Is marked by one's obedience. There are going to be trials. There's there's going to be times when sin is going to get the best of us. We don't like it. But over the long term, a person's life is marked by by one's obedience to God. And so, not as, uh, he says, just as you have always obeyed. In other words, your life has been marked uh, as, as evidence that you belong to God. Just as in my presence, uh, or I should say, uh, not as in my presence only, uh, he understands that these Philippians, that they had authentically changed hearts. Uh, it wasn't that they found some religion. It wasn't that they were trying to achieve something you know, through their good works. It wasn't as if they were acting like believers uh, in hopes of impressing the apostle. Their faith was real. He understood that. Not as in my presence only. He says, but now, much more in my absence. Uh, religion, and I, I really I think you, if those of you that have been around me know I can't stand the word. Uh, religion has sent a lot of people off to hell. Religion can emanate from a man-made piety. Uh, religion can emanate from deeds simply that are not from a heart that has been born again. Uh, and we see that in many quote-unquote religions. So he says, but, not, but now much more in my absence. They weren't content, and this is to, for the glory of God, okay? They weren't content with, their, with just the status quo as far as their spiritual maturity goes. Uh, loving one another, being concerned with one another. But it, it came from, as far as Paul can attest... Their love for one another and their concern for one another was coming from hearts that were truly born again, and it wasn't just through outward appearances or showmanship. Okay, it, it, it's it's one thing, as they say, it's one thing when 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 you perform and you behave well in front of the pastor. It's a whole other thing when the pastor's not there. Okay, so he understands that their their walk. Uh, is being carried out from from hearts that are truly born from above. And he understands that. So if that's the case, so then, my beloved, just as you've always obeyed, you've got this, this walk going, right? Uh, a, a life that is marked by obedience, not as, not as in my presence only, but now much, much more in my absence. So it's not as if I have to be there for you to walk this walk. If that's the case... Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So this has been obviously a phrase which has been batted around by many theologians, by by teachers, and uh, for for quite some time. 
The Greek order is rather different than what we see in the English. In fact, the Greek order reads exactly like this. With fear and trembling, your own salvation work out. With fear and trembling, your own salvation work out. So let's, let's start breaking this one down. To fear God. To fear God means a deep reverence for God. Understanding who he is, his position, his holiness, his magnificence, his sovereignty, and understanding who we are. And we are certainly not deserving of his love. And we are not deserving of everlasting life. So there's this deep reverence, understanding who he is. He is our Heavenly Father. And we understand he's also the master of the entire universe. So we understand who he is. We also understand our finite nature. As we grow in our knowledge of the Word and of the Spirit, it continues to guide us. It continues to teach us. And as that time goes on, one will develop a growing desire to please God in all aspects of one's life. As you mature. As you mature in your faith, it's not going to be so much about you. It's going to be more about Him and it's going to be about more those or those who are around you. Just like a, just like a little one. Little infants, as they grow up, they get into, into toddlers, they get into children, right? School-aged children. Hey, don't be too surprised when they're selfish. But as the child grows up, as the child gets older, what usually happens with adults, adult children? They're not dependent anymore on their parents. In fact, it's the, it's, it, it, oftentimes a mature adult will try and do as much as they can for their, for their, uh, uh, for their parents. And they, they show the love, all the, the care and, and everything that my parent has shown me. It's, it's time I show you the kind of love that you've done for me, that you showed me. So, and that comes, of course, with maturity. So let's, let's break this down. So we've got this, this, uh, uh, a healthy, reverential fear for God. So what is this fear and trembling? Okay, well... Trembling. Let's let's tackle this one. Trembling is the outward sense of that reverence. Is the outward sense of that of that of that uh, reverence. Uh, fear, on the other hand, you could say is that inward reverence. I fear God. It's a reverence towards God that is inward. Trembling is that reverence toward God's which is outward. Fear is the attitude towards God. And understanding who he is. The trembling part of it is my actions as I display exactly who I know God is, who he is. Fear is the, the, the inward, trembling is the outward. So, fear and trembling denotes a proper attitude, which starts inside, which results in the proper actions. So when somebody says... I, you know, you ask somebody, are you, are you a Christian? And I wouldn't even advise you even ask somebody that. Are you born again? There, there, now you're really getting to the, the heart of the matter. Are you born again? Are you truly a believer? If that's the case, then there has to be some actions involved. There, there's going to be some kind of family resemblance. If God is your father, and as you mature there's going to be some kind of family resemblance. You're going to start talking more like him. You're going to start acting more like him, looking more like him, your behavior, everything about it. And you're also going to show love for other family members, your siblings, right? Brothers and sisters in the Lord. If that's not there, if, if somebody says, yeah, I'm a Christian, and they look and sound and act exactly as they did five years ago, and there's no love for the brethren, then that person's not saved. It's impossible. Second Corinthians seven fifteen, Paul writes about. He says about Titus, his affection, Titus's affection, abounds all the more towards you as he remembers the obedience of you all, how you received him with fear and trembling. So there's this inward, this inward. Uh, reverential understanding of who God is, which is also displayed in our actions, fear and trembling. All right, so work out your salvation with fear and trembling. This is not something to be viewed negatively. In fact, we ought to be desiring it as we grow and mature in the uh, mature in uh, spirit and in truth. Work out your salvation. 
So certainly, Paul is not uh, prescribing a works-based salvation, especially when he wrote to the Ephesians, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, not, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. So how could he say one thing to the Ephesians and tell the Philippians something else? So he's certainly not promoting a works-based salvation. Work out your salvation. Titus 3, verse 5, He saved us, not on the basis of deeds, which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. So this salvation which we're talking about, work out our salvation, is comprised of both being declared righteous, which is our justification, the day you got saved, as well as becoming more and more set apart in holiness and thus from sin, and that's sanctification. Someone can't say, I've been justified, and yet there's no sanctification process going on. Something's amiss. So that believer has to be, has to be maturing and maturing if they're truly a believer. So, Work out your salvation. In fact, work out your own salvation. Paul is referring to the process of one's sanctification, meaning the believer's continued victories against the old sinful nature. There are going to be days when sin's going to get the best of you. You understand that. You ask for forgiveness. You learn from it. Certainly we're not going to forget our sins. We shouldn't be forgetting our sins. You have to learn from them. And then you move on. This this growth process. And then the next time when that's, then that tr trial comes along or that temptation comes along, you understand where it's coming from. You understand the weakness. You understand what you need to do. Hegg writes in his commentary, the theological truth we learn from this is that our ultimate and final sanctification is secure and inevitable. But God has ordained that the process of final sanctification will also involve our participation. So God has sanctified you. He set, it, he set you aside for a purpose. You're a kingdom of priests. He has sanctified you. Now, it's, now we do have a part to play in that. He's given us, of course, the word. We have it. He's given us the spirit. It indwells. And now we must allow that word and that spirit to start to work in us and through us. For it is God, he says, who is at work in you. The only way that we're ever going to secure those, those victories. Yesterday, my temper got the best of me. But today, I won the victory. Well, how is that possible? It's from God. For it is God who is at work in you. Otherwise, it's, if, if that's the case, it, it's... You may hear somebody say, especially at, or when New Year's comes around, oh, that somebody smokes and they say, uh, my New Year's resolution, I'm going to stop smoking. Well, that's, that's strictly out of the flesh. That has nothing to do with the Holy Spirit. All that is is willpower. Anybody can do that. But keep in mind, all, all that is done without faith according to the scriptures, is sin. All that is done without faith is, according to God, is sin. It is only through the gift of faith, washing of regeneration, being clothed in His righteousness, that we can be pleasing to God at all. Ephesians 1, verses 4-6, through 6, just as He chose us in Him, before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before Him, in love he predestined us to adoption as sons through Yeshua Messiah to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. So for it is God who is at work in you, that is, enables you to even perform good deeds whatsoever, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So think of it this way, your salvation is of his choosing. It's his spirit that removed the blindness. Your salvation is of his choosing. Our growing in him, 
that sanctification process is evidence of his rejoicing over the saving of our lost spirit. Think about it that way. When we grow as a believer, yesterday my temper got to me. Today, praise be to God, I had the same situation and I didn't let it get the best of me. God rejoices over that. God rejoices over that. Continuing, verse 14, do all things without grumbling or disputing. So for Paul, love one another, that love for one another, understanding that the love that we do have for one another and that we should be displaying and put on display can only come from the Messiah. And Tim writes, Paul teaches us here that the unity of believers within a given local community offers a powerful testimony to the watching world of God's redeeming grace. For to put the needs and cares of others as a priority offers a significant expression of God's love for those he has saved, a love that was ultimately demonstrated in the very giving of himself to purchase their redemption. So what better way to show a world that is watching us that we serve a, a, a Savior and a God who loves and who gives by what? Loving and giving to others. And especially to the household of faith, right? So it's, it's, it's easy to love those who are receptive to our love. Of course. It is, it, it's easy to come to, hey, the, a Shabbat service or uh, you attend a, ch a church service there and there's other believers there. It's, it's easy to show love. Uh, to exhibit love when when you're in a setting and it's receptive and you're around those who are receptive it is not easy to love those who are antagonistic it's not easy to love those and yet what does Yeshua say in Luke 6 27 and 28 but I say to you who hear love your enemies do good to those who hate you bless those who curse you pray for those who mistreat you <laughs> I mean, wait a minute. To love, to do good, to bless and to pray. Well, that's easy to do that with brothers and sisters in the Lord. Yeshua is saying, yeah, I know that's easy. Do it to those who hate you. Do it to those who mistreat you and abuse you. Pray for those who have taken advantage of you. That's not easy. And yet that's exactly what Yeshua tells us to do. So, again... If, if we are to bless those right who curse us, if we're to pray for those who mistreat us, if we're to love those who we would consider enemies, if we're to do good to those who actually hate us, if that's the case, how much more are we to do those very same thing, those very same things to the people, our brothers and sisters who are in the family of God? See? He says, do all things. I mean, everything, everything which is carried about in your everyday experiences, everything, do all things without grumbling. Okay, so here's this interesting, without grumbling or disputing. Let's, let's take a look at these two, two terms, without grumbling. Uh, gongismas is the Greek word, grumbling. It means a murmuring or a secret displeasure. And what's interesting, the secret displeasure is something that's inward. So remember, he just talked about fear and trembling, right? So the fear is inward, the trembling is outward. Now we've got the same thing. Grumbling, that's inward. That's, I'm, I'm murmuring to myself. There's a displeasure that's in within myself. Then you've got disputing. Well, now it's not inward anymore. Now disputing, it's, it's a verbal exchange. It's something that's outward, which expresses the displeasure that's going on inside. By the time it gets to a dispute, <laughs> the grumbling and the murmuring has already been going on. I, as somebody said, well, they, they hurled an insult. This was years ago. And I took this person aside. I said, you know, I didn't appreciate what you said. And they said, well, I didn't, I didn't mean what I said. Well, yes, of course they did. Because it came out your mouth. <laughs> By the time it comes out the mouth, it's been sitting inside already for quite some time. 
the, the murmuring and the displeasure was there. The grumbling was there. Then the dispute came out. So allowing such in the community, imagine when you've got brothers and sisters in the Lord, whether it's a shul on Shabbat, whether it's a church on Sunday, allowing that to sit there in a congregation, the murmuring, the disputing, those kind of things, uh, entices the sinful flesh to persist and then strengthen. And eventually, if those things aren't dealt with, and sh we should be able to deal with them on a personal level, eventually it's going to get out. And now other people are going to be infected by it. Okay, so if we allow for the grumbling spirit to persist, eventually it will lead to the dispute. If you let it sit in the heart long enough, it's going to come out. Verse 15, so that you will prove yourselves. All right. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, okay? so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God, above reproach, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world. So striving not to grumble or dispute prayerfully leads to life which imitates our Savior. You don't see Yeshua behaving in that way. You don't hear of Yeshua grumbling or murmuring. The disputes he had, any disputes he had, were, were with those that deserved it. He says, so that you will prove yourselves. To prove yourselves mean uh, to become or to be born. It's a proceeding. So that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent. To be blameless and innocent. You and I, we have already been, we have already been, or I should say, we have been declared as righteous as far as God is concerned. In the courtroom of God, who is our judge, our names have already been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. They're there. And they will forever be there. So as far as God is concerned, really, as his children, we are blameless and innocent. All right, That doesn't mean we don't sin. But as far as God is concerned, his son's blood has washed those sins away. We are, we are blameless. We're innocent. We belong to him. Our, our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Children of God above reproach. So the ultimate goal of growing in our faith is supposed to be pleasing to the Father. Why is this why why is this so so important? We're not going to be grumbling, we're not going to be murmuring, we're not going to be disputing. We've already been declared righteous as far as God is concerned. He considers us his children. But keep in mind that there is an audience that is watching us. There is a world that is watching us that does not know God, and they are not the, not the children of God. We live in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. So, our testimony is to a watching world, and this world that is watching us, which is lost, they know when we're grumbling, and they know when we're murmuring, and when we're disputing, and when there's division. And that's our testimony. That's our testimony. Our culture is twisted. Our culture is deformed. And ultimately contrary to the standards of God. But truth be told, every generation, ever since the fall, has been tainted by sin and rebellion towards God. Every generation. And if you don't believe me, just ask Abel when you see him. And he'll tell you just how wicked and, and perverse the generation was, even during, even during that day. So that verse, that, that, that phrase, describes every single generation going all the way back to the fall. We live in a twisted and deformed, wicked, crooked, and a perverse uh, generation. Now, what's our, but, but what's our responsibility? among whom you appear 
as lights in the world. If we do what we're supposed to do, behave the way we're supposed to behave, love one another, do all things without grumbling or disputing, the world is going to see we're different and we're not like them. They're in darkness, we're in light. Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So those were the words of Yeshua back in Matthew chapter 5, and all Paul is doing is reiterating exactly what the Master has already said. Our world is a very dark place. And the children of darkness are doing the works of their father. And you see it every day. Don't be surprised. We're to be doing the works of our father. And when you perhaps, and, and this will be our, our last verse you know, for the evening, but I'm sure some of you, can. You, you, this has happened, when, uh, especially with uh, uh, when the, the sun goes down earlier, you, you go out somewhere, perhaps you, you wind up going somewhere, and you, you, you're there longer than what you thought you were going to be. Maybe perhaps something had happened, a uh, car broke down, or you were going off to a party in the evening or a service, and you, what did you do? You left the house, and you forgot to turn on a light. Maybe the living room light or what have you. And then by the time you get home, it's dark. And you open up the front door and you walk in and the house is dark and the living room is dark and everything is dark. And whether you go to a, a, the lamp itself or you go to a light switch, you hit the light, what happens to the darkness? It flees. It flees. Turning on the lights makes the darkness flee. That's our responsibility. I mean, that's why God has... After saving us, he didn't take us home. Not yet. We have work to do. And, and part of our responsibility is exposing that darkness. And we live in a very, very dark world. Very dark world. And so let our light shine. Let our light shine, trusting in the Lord, for he is faithful and true. We're going to stop there with verse 15. And uh, when we pick it up next time, of course, we'll uh, start in on Philippians 2 and verse number 16.